we are slowly going to start. Um, actually, we would like to wait because we are very much aware that this was not an easy uh, place to find. Uh, but we have to start because there are quite some people online. Uh, and otherwise, they might think that the event uh, is not taking place. So we do start, but we can welcome more people who come in rather or somewhat uh, late. Um, I'm not going to say the bad joke that here there are turbulent times as well, but this was, of course, rather unpredictable that it uh, would happen. So very welcome, everybody here and also people uh, who are watching online. My name is Jan Willem Duivendak. I'm director of NIAS, the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study in the Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, NIAS is an institute that hosts 50 to 60 fellows per year, um, mostly people working on their own individual projects, but also each year we invite a theme group or two theme groups. And tonight, uh, the NIAS theme group of this semester um, will um, speak about their research, their ongoing research, um, often but not always and not exclusively uh, with relations to the elections and also the elections in the Netherlands at this moment. But indeed, uh, the moment we uh, invited them to come to NIAS, that's about almost two years ago, I think. Obviously, we didn't know that there would be elections in the Netherlands uh, later this month, on November 22nd. So that is coincidence, um, but we are very happy to, ha to have them here so that they can uh, put our elections in a comparative perspective. As for the program, um, there will be an introduction by Matthijs Rodan, uh, and then we will have a panel discussion with the other three members, but also with Matthijs. Um, and then after half an hour, we open it up to the audience. So there will be Q&A. Uh, so please prepare your uh, questions as well. Um, but first, the floor is for Matthijs Rodijn. Matthijs is a social professor of political science at the University of Amsterdam. Matthijs. Thank you. Um, as all of you uh, will know, there will be elections uh, in the Netherlands in just over uh, three weeks. Um, and um, most of you, or those of you who uh, understand Dutch, will have noticed that the election com campaign is very slowly gathering steam right now. Um, we are going to uh, talk about the elections, but only a little bit. We're going to take the elections, the Dutch, Dutch elections, as a point of departure to talk more generally about elections, about parties, about voters, uh, about transformations of politics in Europe in a comparative perspective. So that is what we are going to do. And um, I would like to start this uh, introduction by, or basically the whole introduction, is an introdu introduction to five themes that I think are striking when we take a look at, well, elections in the Netherlands in general, but also these specific uh, elections in the Netherlands. Um, and based on these five different themes, we will later on have a panel discussion, and later you can also ask all kinds of questions about them, but also about topics that are uh, in a different way related. Um, so five themes. Um, and the first one is that the Netherlands is famous for its system of, well, very proportional representation. Um, compared to many other systems, take for instance majoritarian systems like the one in the UK or the United States, um, representation is very proportional. And that means that that actually votes, the percentage of votes that parties get, are directly translated into seats. Um, and this is different in majoritarian systems, but it's also different in many proportional systems, because in many systems there is a sort of a bonus for the biggest party, or there are thresholds for smaller parties, and that leads to, well, less proportional representation. In the Netherlands, we don't really have that. So there is really proportional representation, meaning that Parties that receive 2% of the votes also get 2% of the seats. So it's really, it's translated directly. There are no real hindrances to this representation. Um, and the result is this. We have a ve very colorful parliament. This is the, the second chamber. Um, 150 seats and about 20 
parties. And that is good news when we take the perspective of representation, right? Because we have many different groups and all these different groups can gain representation in Parliament relatively easily. Of course, there are also disadvantages because when, it's really, when the system is really fragmented, it's a bit more difficult to form a government coalition. But in general, when it comes to legitimacy, when it comes to how trustful people are, how satisfied they are with politics, we know that proportional representation is a good thing. So I think the system in the Netherlands, proportional representation, is something that leads to a lot of inclusion. We have a system where all groups are equally included in the political system. Right? No. This was the situation a couple of years ago in the Netherlands. These are the leaders of uh, the most important parties represented in Parliament. And you can see that they have something in common. Um, and it's not only this. In the Netherlands, we think that we are very inclusive, but we have never had a female prime minister. Um, also, if we take a look at uh, the percentage of female representative in, in, in Parliament, uh, only once since the Second World War has it exceeded the 40%. Um, so it's really not that equal, equal uh, as we sometimes think. And this is just gender. Also when it comes to levels of education or when it comes to other uh, factors, we see that, well, it's not really equal. Um, and that raises all kinds of questions. Do we want uh, representation? Do we want our representatives to be a sort of a miniature version of society? Do we want it to be uh, to, 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 to reflect the divisions that we see in society when it comes to social demographics? That's an important question that we need to ask ourselves. Um, but we also see, and I think in particular as well during this election, that many people also don't feel represented. Many people are unsatisfied with their representatives, with their politicians. They think that they're not doing a good job. So that is also part of this idea of representation. And uh, Stephanie Rea will talk about this, this topic a bit more generally when it comes to uh, uh, all kinds of forms of representation uh, later on during this talk. The second element I wanted to highlight is the decline of the mainstream left. And this is something that happens in many European countries. Um, but also in the Netherlands. And I think the Netherlands is uh, a very good example uh, because we have the PvdA, and the PvdA, the Social Democratic Party in the Netherlands, is a good example because it was a very popular party until relatively recently, and they lost a lot of support in the last couple of years. So in the uh, 1980s, the party was supported by about, uh, mo well, by more than 30%. Um, in the 90s, a bit less, 25 to 30 percent, uh, but then uh, it declined rapidly. So in 2002, the, the election uh, with uh, Pim Fortuyn, uh, the party only got uh, support from 15 percent of the voters. And later on, it became better a bit, but the last two elections, uh, the PvdA was supported by 6 percent of the voters. So that's not very much for uh, what is traditionally one of the biggest parties in the country. Um, and the Netherlands is just one example. We see it all over Europe. This is a, a figure that was made by Tarek. Um, and you can see uh, support for social democratic parties in, uh, uh, I think, almost all Western European countries. And you can see that it declined support from 30, about 30% to about 20%. So a steep decline. The question then, of course, is how, how come? What are, what are the causes of this decline of social democracy? And also, how can it be, well, solved for the Social Democrats. Um, and I mention this because I think that these elections are really interesting um, because we uh, in the Netherlands are an interesting laboratory for the collaboration between a Green Party and a Social Democratic, Social Democratic Party. Um, so it remains to be seen how successful they are going to be, but it's a very interesting experiment when it comes to politics uh, on the left side of the political spectrum. And Tarek will say uh, much more about this later. Third, um, resistance from the center. I will show you the same graph here, but now I included the uh, support for radical right parties. Um, and that support increased from about 5% in the 1990s to about 15%, a little bit more, right now. Um, and this is also something that we saw in the Netherlands. Uh, Pim Fortuyn was supported by about 17% of the voters. Geert Wilders in 2010 by about 
and Thierry Baudet and his Forum for Democracy uh, also by about, uh, I think it was 15% as well, during the provincial elections uh, uh, in 2019. Um, so also in the Netherlands there is this strong support base for radical right parties. But what is really interesting, if we take a look at these elections, I think that is that resistance doesn't only come from the radical right, but also from the political center. Um, so this is the uh, Peilingweiser, um, and here you can see support for two <laughs> relatively new parties, the BBB, uh, the Farmers uh, Citizens Party in the Netherlands, and New Social Contract of Pieter Omtzigt. Um, and these parties are not radical right parties, but they do challenge the established mainstream parties. Um, and you can see that the uh, BBB, I mean, they're not performing as well as they did before. There is a steep decline, but they're still supported by 6 to 8% in the polls. So it's a decent player in Dutch politics. 6 to 8% means that you're pretty big in the Netherlands in a fragmented party system. Um, and also, Pieter Omtzigt is leading the polls together with the VVD. And it's interesting because the first party, the BBB, is, I would label it as an agrarian populist party. Um, it, 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 it represents the interests of farmers, but also says that it represents the values of people living in the countryside, but also uh, is attractive to people who are dissatisfied, more general, with politics. But they do not have a radical right agenda, not a radical right program. Um, so it's interesting, it comes from the center. And even more so for, I would say, Pieter Omtzigt, who is a Christian Democrat. Also his uh, party program is Christian Democratic, I would say. Uh, the huge difference, one of the huge, the, according to me, the biggest difference with the CDA, the traditional Christian Democrats in the Netherlands, is that they have always been very traditional, also when it comes to political reforms, and Omtzigt is a politician and his party, he really wants to change politics. He wants to change the way in which we practice politics, he wants to reform the electoral system, he really wants political reform. So that is really different compared to the CDA. So now, to some extent, not only because Geert Wilders and his PVV is also doing well in the polls, but there's also a lot of resistance coming from the center, and I think that is really interesting. Fourth, um, a left-wing zeitgeist question mark. Um, so you have all probably seen the word bestaanszekerheid. Uh, it means something like economic security. Uh, that's, that's a rough translation, I would say. Um, but there is a lot of focus on this term because all parties by now embrace the term. They all want more economic security from very left-wing parties to very right-wing parties. So it's really interesting to ask the question, what does it mean? Um, it really frustrates the, radic the radical left party in the Netherlands. They, they, they basically said, uh, uh, what is going on? Uh, I mean, what is happening? Why now? Uh, we have always asked for more uh, economic security for people who are not uh, having, uh, having a good life. So why is it now so important to all these other parties? And most importantly, what have they done uh, in the meantime to do something about it? Um, and yeah, it's really interesting that they now are all uh, embracing bestaanszekerheid as their main, one of their main issues. And the question also then becomes whether we are going back to some form of class politics. Is it really again about socioeconomic redistribution? Are we again seeing similar divides as we have seen earlier? earlier? Um, Macarena is going to talk about this uh, topic later, more about class politics and the extent to which we see uh, class politics in, 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 in Europe and uh, what is changing in the last couple of years. And finally, we see a lot of volatility, but also stability. Let me start with uh, volatility. Um, let me first tell you what it means. Uh, electoral volatility means that people are switching between parties. So when volatility is increasing, people are increasingly switching uh, between elections from one party to another. Um, and in the Netherlands and in many countries, party system have for a long time been frozen, uh, meaning that people were not switching. It was a pillarized party system in the Netherlands. If you were born as a Catholic, you would go to a Catholic school, uh, you would go to a Catholic sports club, uh, you, will, uh, you would then watch a Catholic television program and you would vote eventually for the Catholic party. Uh, that, of course, is not happening anymore. Voters are really voting right now. They're switching between parties. So there's increasing volatility. And that's true uh, not only in the Netherlands, but all across Europe. And 
this, graphs, th this graph uh, shows, uh, uh, shows it at a glance. It represents the number of seats that change between parties in an election. So you can see that there was not a lot of volatility in the 60s. It increased in the 70s, but then there was a steep incline in the 90s and a very big one in 2002. That was the Pimfotown election. And since then, you can see that levels of volatility are much higher. So people are much more switching between parties. This is 2021. If we take the, um, the opinion polls as a point of departure right now, we would now be over here. So again, very high levels of volatility. Of course, it can still change, right? We don't know what's going to happen yet, but the levels seem to be high as well. Think about the BBB, think about the decline of CDA, think about Peter Omtzigt. It was low here because this was the aftermath of the pandemic and people were not really uh, inclined to vote for, to do experiments with their voting behavior, so to say. This, uh, these levels of volatility, um, for some people maybe suggest that people are voting that they're just like behaving like drift sand and voting the one time for D66, the next time for the PVV and the next time for the CDA. That's not the case. People are pretty stable. People have choice sets. They have a couple of parties that they feel attracted to. And then when the actual elections uh, are there, they will make a decision also based on uh, the behavior of the party leader, uh, what the party did in the last couple of years, what the promises of the party are, uh, a strategic vote, vote my, uh, strategic uh, reasons might also be important. Um, and you can see it in this graph, how relatively stable the Dutch electorate is. Um, this is support for left-wing parties, and this is support for right-wing parties. And you can see there is fluctu fluctuation, but there is also a lot of stability overall. Um, there's, it's also true that right-wing parties are much more popular than left-wing parties, always, during every election. And um, it, was a, it was a very low score for left-wing parties in 2021. The reason is, to some extent, because many left-wing voters voted for uh, D66, uh, D66, which is a center party, uh, and therefore the left-wing parties lost votes. Um, but if we look right now, it would be very similar. The right-wing parties would score a bit higher and the left-wing parties uh, also a bit higher. Um, and um, because it, that goes at the expen uh, expense of the center parties. Um, but that would still be, it would still re be relatively stable. There won't be very big changes compared to previous elections. Um, okay, so these were five different themes I think are interesting when we take a look at the ele elections right now. But there are also themes that, are, that play a role in European politics more broadly. Um, it's not just the Dutch system, it's basically politics all over Europe uh, that look very similar. Uh, and I think in the next couple of uh, minutes, the next hour or so, uh, we want to talk about that a bit more. Not so much focusing on the Dutch elections, but taking the elections as a point of departure to talk about these more general structures, processes and transformations. And we will do that with uh, all of you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Matthijs, uh, for this very concise uh, presentation of the Dutch situation. As you said, um, what we are going to do is um, to take it as a starting point of the discussion to make it more comparative. Uh, and even though Dutch scientists can also do comparative work, we are very happy to have a couple of non-Dutch scholars uh, who will help to do so. Is it audible? Yeah. Um, so let me first introduce the three people here on stage who have not been introduced yet. Uh, to my left, uh, Stephanie Reyer, and she is a reader in government and public policy at the University of Strathclyde in the United Kingdom. Uh, next to her is Macarena Ares, and she is assistant professor of political science, constitutional law and philosophy of law at the University of Barcelona, Spain. And next to her, sorry, there is Tariq Abu Shadi, and he is associate professor in European Union and Comparative European Politics uh, at the Department of Nuffield College at the University of Oxford. Very welcome, welcome all three of you. And what we are going to do is that I will raise a very general question, and you can first elaborate on that question, and then we move on to a more conversational style. 
Um, and Matthijs already introduced uh, your themes somewhat. So if I may start with Stephanie, I think the obvious but very important question nonetheless is um, that Matthijs showed that various groups in the Netherlands are not so well represented uh, or more recently only represented in Dutch politics and that's of course true uh, in many uh, political systems. But then the basic question would be why does it matter whether different groups of society are present in the positions of political power? Even if you're a minority, I mean you can still be represented by other people or not. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, you can, but there might be some issues with that. I'll, I'll come to that for a, uh, in, in a moment. Um, yeah, so in the lead up to elections and in the aftermath, very often, of course, we talk about political parties, and you know they are indeed the probably the most important actor or institution, um, you know, representing people basically, making sure that um, public opinion is translated into the legislative debate and into public policy, ultimately. Um, but I would argue that it also matters who the individuals are who are you know, elected, who are representing us, and also those who are um, running for elections, even if they don't get elected uh, in the end. Um, and that's because only the voices that are represented in Parliament can be heard, right? Only the voices that are in the room can be heard. Um, and of course, politicians represent political parties, um, but um, at the same time, they don't really leave their identities, their experiences, their social backgrounds, and so on, at the door when they enter Parliament. Um, and you ask whether you know, people from a certain social group can't be represented by um, people from other social groups. And, you know, in principle, that could be the case, right? In principle, men could represent the interest of women. Uh, white people can represent the interest of people of color if they know what these interests, preference are, right? And that's very often the issue, that um, there very often just isn't an awareness and an understanding of what the preferences, the kind of everyday life um, and, and the issues and problems that people experience are um, amongst um, you know, people who are not members of that group. And that is particularly true when those groups have been systematically underrepresented and marginalized in society. Um, so I'll just give a, a quick example. So most of my research is on the representation of uh, disabled people. Um, obviously a group that you know, is strongly marginalized in society as well as in politics, um, really everywhere uh, across the world. Um, and um, there are some examples uh, when it comes to um, especially policy um, aiming at um, you know, environmental protection and um, mitigating the effects of climate change, which are very often in tension with the interest of disabled people. And that is not to say that they don't, as a group, don't care about climate change, right? I mean, they're very often one of the groups that is most at risk of the effects of climate change. But when we look at policies such as, um, for example, um, the ban of uh, plastic straws, which you know is in place in many you know across the EU, many other countries across the world as well. Um, that's an issue where disabled people were very often, or their their needs were very often ignored when the policy was formulated, because a lot of disabled people depend on plastic straws being available when they're out and about, you know, in restaurants, cafes, and so on, and that poses a lot of problems. And having to bring that up after the fact, once those policies are in place, then creates a lot of tensions. Um, and, you know, changing those laws then, you know, can take a long time and can really kind of diminish the access to public life of people. Another example is um, uh, in the cities that are blocked off to traffic, which I think might have also been in place in Amsterdam. I've read a little bit about that. Um, and, you know, of course, the goals are often to decrease pollution and so on. Um, but at the same time, if disabled people aren't at the table when those policies are made, then people just very often, even if, it, if there's no bad intention at play, they might forget you know, just simply not be aware that some people might need exceptions to that, right? That putting those policies into place basically diminishes their 
access again to, to public life and their ultimately their, their quality of life. Now, at the same time, of course, um, you know, not all people from you know, all social groups have the same preferences, right? Groups are, you know, there are large groups, like disabled people, for example, women, people of color, they're, they're large groups with really diverse interests, right? Um, but what that means is that it's not enough to just have one token representative or a few in parliament, right? Because there's, there's no way they, you know, they were aware of all the different experiences. Um, they will have their own experiences, their own identities, also their own other identities, right? Um, you know, disabled people, for example, will also have a gender identity. They might have a racial identity. Or they might just be interested in policies that don't have anything to do with any of those specific groups, right? So also it can be quite a lot of pressure then on these individuals to represent those social groups. Um, but what that means, I think, is rather than saying, okay, social groups, identities shouldn't matter at all in polit politics, that we need to make sure that there is enough diversity so that there isn't too much pressure on the individuals who are there, and also that parties across the political spectrum are making sure that they have diversity and inclusion on the agenda, um, and that you know, it doesn't necessarily take you know, specific political parties you know, run by a specific group, but that really the groups can be, you know, can, be, can be found, can voice preferences across the whole spectrum of political views. Um, what I understand from what you say is that experiential knowledge, dus ervaringsdeskundigheid, uh, is a very important aspect, right? Because if you don't have those experiences, then you will be overlooked in policy making. Um, which sounds actually quite convincing. Uh, but in politics or people thinking about questions of representation, I think they often don't have this kind of pragmatic ways of thinking. Like, like for, for instance, in France, right? In France, they will say, well, we are colorblind, we are genderblind. We don't look at the people who represent others. Everybody can re represent everybody. And obviously, right, then there are only white male people in French parliament. But anyway, the idea is that your body doesn't matter. But then you would argue it's not about abstract bodies, it is about the experiences people have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but why then? Because interesting enough, there are discussions, at least in the Netherlands, about representation of people of color, women, sexual orientation. I'm not sure whether people with disabled people, whether they are visible in parliament actually, and whether that has been a struggle in the Netherlands compared to other groups that are unrepresented. Can you say something about that? And then we move on to your colleagues. Mm -hmm. So, well, unfortunately, there's very little I can say, but that's not only because I'm not an expert on Dutch politics, but also because it's a general problem that we don't have data on the representation of disabled people in politics, or very little data. The little data that we have suggests that they are strongly underrepresented in parliaments um, around the world, really. Um, but then we have to rely on um, uh, for instance, surveys across um, amongst parliamentarians where response rates tend to be very low. Um, it isn't collected alongside other demographic um, information. Um, but when we look at the surveys that do exist, they often put um, disabled uh, parliamentarian at around one or two percent, and um, about 20 to 25 percent of the population have some kind of disability. So even if it's much higher, and even if a lot of disabled people in politics don't want to disclose because a lot of disabilities are invisible and you know there's a lot of stigma attached to it, even if a lot of people don't want to disclose, um, and you know even if numbers are actually two or three times as high, that's probably still not you know, representative of the public. Again, whether it needs to be exactly the same percentage okay. is a different question. I'm not necessarily saying that, but that seems to be quite a strong underrepresentation of this group, but of course also of you know, many other groups in society. Thanks. Um, that brings us quite logically to the question um, also somewhat introduced by Matthijs already. Um, what about class then? So. There has been complaints that people with a working class background are not well represented in Dutch parliament or in other European parliaments. That's mostly middle class people who are uh, there. Um, 
does the accent the accent on sorry the accent on bestaanszekerheid so economic security does that change this will there be more an accent on class politi politics do you think um, well those are two uh, different questions i will start start with the second one and then i will go back to the first one about the representation um, so if we think about topics, economic security, economic well-being discussed, whether people are experiencing uh, material deprivation, whether they're having a hard time uh, making ends meet, we might think that we're going back to that classic, let's say, economic debate about the role of the welfare state. Do we want a strong state that regulates, that redistributes um, income provides services, benefits, or do we want a smaller welfare state that leaves more room for the market to operate? And that would lead us to think that um, we might see again a conflict between the working class and the capital owners, for instance. But I would argue that today when economic conflict becomes important in elections and is talked about, the debate is more complex than that because it's not just about how big the state should be, the welfare state should be, but it's also about who the welfare state targets, targets and what kind of benefits and services it provides. And here is where we also see across Europe increasing complexity in class conflict around this topic. Because I would argue... Um, and research conducted with some colleagues, we find that there is a new dimension of economic conflict um, that divides people and social classes in terms of the kind of welfare state that they want. Do they want a more inclusive welfare state that expands the pool of solidarity to certain groups whose needs haven't been traditionally covered by the welfare state? Or should it increase the benefits that are available for those groups that have traditionally benefited from this? And here is where we also see a clear contrast between social classes. Um, and it's interesting because we see the parts of the middle class, left-wing middle class, uh, mostly professionals in service occupations, working for the public sector, who want a strong welfare state, but an inclusive welfare state that provides certain kinds of benefits, like childcare that allows women to enter the labor market and that equals the playing field for children from different families, investment in education policy, regulation that allows uh, young people, migrants, to have a permanent, well-paid position in the labor market. So a welfare state that is more inclusive and recognizes the diversity of economic and social risks that are present in knowledge economies versus a working class that tends to favor strengthening those benefits that have traditionally um, benefited or been targeted as the working class as could be um, well-paid unemployment benefits, uh, maybe for, I don't know, an industrial worker that is laid off close to retirement, higher pensions. And so we see that, in a sense, the, the conflict around the economy and the welfare state could be characterized as tripolar, right? On the one pole, we could have um, still the more market liberal position to just reduce the welfare state, reduce uh, state intervention and leave more room for the market to operate because that's better, that's more efficient. But then even among the people who support the strong welfare state, we can still find conflict and class conflict in terms of the kinds of welfare state that they want. Um, and I think that across Europe, we also see, and particularly in a political system like the Netherlands, where there is a very diversified partisan supply, we see that the interests of workers along this dimension, right, are also represented in the party system. So even if we have seen a professionalization of politics across Western Europe with a reduction in the number of politicians who are coming from a working class background, in terms of the substantive representation of the interests, we find that there are political parties that are um, also standing in this position and it's frequently radical left parties um, and it varies a bit across countries but also radical right parties who are holding okay. these positions towards a more 
towards a strong welfare state, but more segmented, so that it's keeping the benefits for the traditional beneficiaries, but not incorporating new forms of risks into the pool of recipients. Thanks. Um, I don't know the last group, whether you would label that welfare chauvinist or something like that. So it's mostly for the existing or the, the former important groups that did profit from the welfare state. But well, I mean, yeah. welfare chauvinism, right, is, is um, I would say, um, refers more specifically to the question of natives versus migrants, right? Yeah. In this case, we could even be talking about questions like, for instance, pension reform, right? Who is willing to postpone their retirement age and uh, because they're concerned maybe with the sustainability of the pension system versus who wants to maintain uh, an earlier retirement age, right? I wouldn't call okay. this welfare chauvinism. Okay, point um, taken. Um, uh, one of the things that struck me when you just elaborated on those two uh, positions, both in favour of a welfare state, but a different type of welfare state. Um, in the Dutch debate, often those two positions are not um, distinguished. And the idea is that the left doesn't care about new risk or the welfare state, but is just pursuing identity politics, social cultural topics. L a little bit like Piketty and others have been claiming that the left just is not interested anymore in questions of redistribution. But you say they are interested in questions of redistribution, but in a different type of welfare state. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, exactly. And in fact, if we look at the voters of left-wing parties, of different parties within the left-wing bloc, so not only voters of social democratic parties, but also voters of green parties, um, we find that they are consistently placed on a position that demands a strong welfare state, but in this more inclusive position, right? So trying to or, or promote um, welfare state intervention that invests um, in people, in citizens, um, versus just substitute um, income loss due to unemployment or retirement. That is a nice bridge to Tariq, uh, because Social democratic parties then might be might try to be inclusive in their ideas of the welfare state. It doesn't translate so much into attracting new voters or to keep their original voters. So perhaps this, they have this idea. But then two questions obviously there. So how severe is the crisis? Is there the crisis of social democracy or are there plural crises, uh, various crises? And also then, well, depending on what you answer, but what kind of solutions do you see for social democratic parties? Um, yes, so I think there are two ways of how we can look at this question of um, an electoral crisis of social democracy or social democratic parties. Um, the first one is, well, we clearly see that social democratic parties receive lower vote shares than they used to in the past. And obviously the Pevanaz is a very good example of this, and Matthias introduced this, but this is really the rule in, in Europe and all over Western Europe of course, if you look at France, there's a similar implosion, um, but in many other countries in the last five to ten years, especially in the last five years, social democratic parties received their historically worst results in many countries. There's a different way of looking at this, and then we can see which parties are currently leading governments in Western Europe. And then we see that there's a German chancellor, um, that in Norway the Social Democratic Party is leading, in Spain, in Portugal, and so on. So there's a different way of looking at this and seeing, okay, actually, um, in many European countries, social democrats have still won elections. So a crucial question, or two cru crucial questions arise. One is what can explain this electoral decline? And the second question that we can answer or can try to answer from a scientific point of view is what is the appeals that social democratic parties can make to still lead a government, to still become the strongest party um, in these strongly fragmented systems? To um, provide a bit of an answer to the first question, this is something that's been very popular in, 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 in many narratives about um, the decline of social democratic parties, the question, what has happened? How have social democrats um, lost? And one very popular narrative about this, and this is very much to one, related to one slide that Matthias already showed, is the idea that social democrats have lost their working class voters, their former core electoral base, and that many of these voters have now left and are supporting 
the radical right. And with this diagnosis, then often there's an implicit or, or more explicit um, recommendation that is, social democrats should become less progressive on certain issues, especially on immigration, because it is assumed that that progressiveness is related to them losing their core electorate, the working class. And I'm sure everyone's heard this, this narrative before. Um, it is very, very popular. Um, and people who know me a little bit also know that we've done a lot of research uh, on exactly that question. Um, so what we find is that there's very little empirical evidence that actually supports this narrative. One crucial finding that we have is that very simply, social democrats have not lost uh, many voters to the radical right. So there has just been very little exchange um, from social democrats to the radical right in some countries where we can look at this over a long period of time, as, for example, in, in, in Germany. Um, we see that today's AFD voters are not former social democrats, and only a very small share of voters from social democrats has gone to the radical right. What we also find is that social democrats have not overproportionately lost working class voters. They have lost voters from all groups. Proportionally, actually, in the last, especially 10 years, the group that they've lost most, most are educated women. Um, so exactly not the, uh, the classic working class. So again, social democrats have lost a lot of voters in many directions, but mostly they've lost voters to more progressive parties than that. If you look at the other, other side of this, this question also, the, the, the recommendation, can they win with strategies of, um, of taking more anti-immigrant and more uh, conservative positions, one thing that we find is, again, empirically looking at this, that when these parties, social democratic, but also mainstream right parties, take more anti-immigrant or more restrictive positions on immigration, it doesn't weaken the radical right. In contrast, it actually strengthens the radical right. The radical right is usually the winner of that exchange. The idea is really voters will go and vote for the original. If we then look more specifically at social democratic parties, we can also ask what kind of programmatic profile helps to strengthen those parties. And this is also something we've done research on where um, we've run a couple of experiments in, in six European countries where people could pick between two stylized programs of social democratic parties. So we vary them on, on nine typical political issues, pensions, immigration, um, rents, and so on. And then we let people pick the program they prefer. And what we find there is that among the potential social democratic electorate, the strategies that are most popular are a combination of what we call old left and new left policies. So traditionally left-wing welfare state and more progressive issues on questions such as immigration. One reason for this is that those voters, especially from the groups that are usually more skeptical on immigration, or other cultural issues, so lower educated working class voters. We find that they don't pick programs based on these cultural issues, but for them, the economic issues are really central. So basically, to appeal to these voters, an economically left-wing position is already enough. However, looking at more educated voters, they are really the ones who pick their program um, based on these more cultural issues. And so you lose these voters as a social democratic party um, if, you don't pick, um, if you don't take a more progressive position. I'll say maybe one more thing on the, the less programmatic focus, but there's a second crucial element of how you can appeal to voters, and I think this is important for the Dutch context at the moment. So the second group of voters that we look at, we often call now responsibility voters, so voters that really care about um, who leads the government. And here, social democratic parties have had for a long time a strong advantage. Basically, if you were somewhat left-wing and you wanted to pick the party of the prime minister, you would vote for a social democratic party because they were the only one who had a shot at being the prime minister party. Um, now if something happens where you lose a lot of votes as the social democrats did, for example, in the Netherlands in 2017, and you become one party of many, then you lose this coordination function. And this is something you could see in 2021 when this, the, 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 in the, in, in the end of the campaign, the group of voters that really wanted to pick the prime minister and they wanted to pick someone who's not Rutte went to D66. And we've done some more systematic analysis of these, really showing that voters care about how parties are doing in the polls exactly in this question of who they, who they select into. So from this perspective as well, um, that 
the current merger or the running together of, of Hunlings and, and, and Pevana um, is really a good strategy based on, on the research we've done. They do what you want. Well, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. This, <laughs> I, like all, all social democratic parties <laughs> always do exactly what. Yeah, they, want. Never, they, they read your uh, research. Let's say, yeah. Uh, well, that is fascinating. So, because you sp you spoke about right, the Netherlands being a laboratory, lab what is the laboratorium uh, for progressive politics. Um, do we see anywhere else in Europe? the merger or the, the close cooperation between green parties and social democratic parties? Is it the, the, the type of party that you see for the future for the left? So I think the only other country where we're really seeing something comparable right now is of course France, where you have a very different type of electoral system and of course a much later decision to do this on the side of the social democrats and the greens, right? So with a much worse deal for them in the end, um, I think what France shows how difficult it is for political parties to achieve that level of collaboration, because in, in the French system, especially if you, if you look at runoff system, and especially the, the presidential uh, election, you don't need a political scientist to tell parties, well, you need to go together to have a shot, because otherwise you will not make it to the second round. Um, and if you talked to uh, French politicians of the Parti Socialiste and the Greens, you know, a year before that election, they were just so unwilling to, to yeah, to, 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 to collaborate, and they obviously were always blaming the others um, for it. So I think it's actually quite, quite an achievement of, um, of those parties here um, to, to get there. That might be related also to, indeed, the electoral system. So let's open the discussion among you, perhaps by uh, asking Matthijs another question. You already touched upon the fact that we do have new parties. You said, well, they are mostly showing resistance from the center as well. Um, the party that is highest in the polls, uh, so New Social Contract, um, also has complaints about parliament not being representative. And for them, it's mostly about the underrepresentation of regions, right? So um, if you think about the Dutch political system, um, which group or positions, themes, seems to be most underrepresented? Do you agree with New Social Contract that it is mostly the rural area? Um, we have what is the percentage of farmers in the Netherlands? 2%, I think? How many farmers do we have? I mean, that is really a very tiny group. So it's not really just about the farmers, right? It is more about something else. But I ask the question because they have a very uh, serious proposal to change the electoral system, right? And to make the votes more dependent on where you live. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm not really sure about that. So, I mean... There is one huge disadvantage of such a system because it would mean that you would have to vote for a candidate from your region, that is, the candidate in your district or however you call it. Um, and in the Netherlands, we do not have very strong regions in that way. Of course, some regions or provinces are, but many people in the Netherlands identify with a national political party, identify with national candidates. And I think that going to such uh, um, an, an, an electoral system as Omtzigt proposes would be bad for, for, for this idea of representation on the national level. And I don't think that many Dutch citizens will actually, actually want that. What they do want, of course, is more they want politicians to change. They want politicians to change their uh, uh, behavior. They want um, also to have more influence when it comes to decision-making by means of referendums, for instance. Um, and I think that um, what is really interesting is that Omtzigt is also, and also the BBB, that they are um, really expressing this type of anti-establishment politics in different ways. So the BBB is doing it in a more populist way. It's the elite that is uh, betraying the people. Whereas Omtzigt, I wouldn't call him a populist, um, that might change. Some, he has had some uh, moments where he was much more populist than he is right now. So he has talked about the elite clique and ordinary citizens that were ignored by, the, by this clique. Um, that was relatively populist. Um, he might go back to that discourse during the election campaign, I don't know. 
But for now, he's not doing it in a very populist way. So he is, um, I think, and that is much more important than his system of regional representation, he is expressing this discontent with politics more generally, together with the BBB. And I think that is something that many people were really waiting for, because many voters were and are dissatisfied with politics, but not radical left or radical right. So I think that, it's, that it is good news that there are parties who are expressing these worries of citizens, but do not force them, well, force them to move to the fringes of the political spectrum. But the very fact that so many people are dissatisfied and that trust in politicians and in the government is really in decline, doesn't it show that our political system of very open representation actually doesn't function very well? So is it not logical that people come up with changes in our electoral system because so many people show discontent with the actual situation? I would maybe turn it around and say that it shows that it's functioning really well <laughs> because um, it, has, uh, it took a while, 20 years, before now that the, there are really things really changing. Um, but the fact that we have such a proportional system uh, and that we have these politicians who can argue that this is a huge problem um, is, I think, a good sign. Um, and it's also, I mean, we have to put it into perspective. So there is much more discontent right now than there was uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah. But in the Netherlands, we are still very trustful when it comes to politics. Discontent is relatively low compared to other countries. And when it comes to satisfaction with the whole democratic system, that is still very high in the Netherlands. And if you compare it in the la over, the, over the last few decades, it, it has increased uh, um, on average. So, I mean, yes, there is a lot of discontent, but it relatively over time and compared to other countries, it's not that low. And also, we should not forget that there were many big issues in the Netherlands, right? We had the, the uh, uh, tax fraud scandal, we had the earthquakes in Groningen, all these things. It, it does make sense that it leads to skept skeptical citizens. And maybe then it's good news that these citizens can express their worries. So to that extent, I think, well, maybe it's good news that this discontent expresses itself. Before we open it to you, uh, perhaps one more question to all of you, because you are totally right that we had our crisis, but I'm afraid every country has its crisis, right? So the, the question is, do we, did we experience bigger, more impactful crises than other countries, um, even though they were very serious to their standards? Right? But perhaps if you look into the crisis of other countries, if you compare that, um, then perhaps there are more similarities. Um, also similarities in the changes in the political landscape. Because uh, I'm mostly struck by the data you were presenting about the declining left, the growth of the radical right. That seems to happen everywhere, irrespective of the political system. Right? There is something about developments among the electorate or among our citizens that the changes seem to happen almost everywhere. And then you might argue along your line that the rise of radical right parties actually shows the responsiveness of the political system everywhere. Would that be a daring expression? Or do you, can you understand that in those... So people for that, that didn't vote in the 80s and the 90s but are voting now for the radical right because now they feel represented. Does that make sense, Tariq? Um, to a certain degree, yes. So to a certain degree, the radical right represents a group of the electorate that just has strongly radical right attitudes, right? So these people, for a long time, didn't vote or maybe voted for a mainstream right party, um, and they now are represented by the, the radical right. If this is a normatively good thing or bad thing, I think is a, is a different discussion. I would say it's a bad thing, um, but uh, it, it is true that this is a certain share of the electorate. But of course, what has happened over the last 20 years is that this, the share of the radical right um, influence has grown a lot. And I think this is the critical question. So um, we have to live with a certain amount of seats that will go to the radical right in basically all over Europe. But the cri critical question is, how much influence will we give to the radical right? And I think there are two uh, critical developments. One is actual political power 
And there, I think, ironically, maybe, we've seen that these more proportional systems have done better um, because they have an easier entrance in the beginning. But what hasn't happened here like, or can't happen here is something like you see in the US um, or you to a certain degree see in the UK at the moment is where a mainstream right party is basically turning into a radical right party. Um, and then you get this outsized influence. Also, um, the next French presidential election will to a certain degree, with a certain likelihood, give us a radical right president in France. Um, and so the, the, the majoritarian element just gives them more political power if there is this tipping point. And the second other crucial question, of course, is um, the ideas of the radical right. So the, 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 the success of the radical right is not only about the political power in terms of seats and, and an office, but of course, how has um, policy change because of the radical right? How has discourse changed because of the radical right? And there, of course, the Netherlands is a bad example in the sense that if you, if you compare uh, statements by the VVD today to statements by Pim Fatown 20 years ago, you will not see a difference in these statements. So the radical right has had a strong influence on um, what has happened in uh, political discourse and in policy, um, and that isn't representing changing attitudes because attitudes haven't become more anti-immigrant. Mm. Um, so we actually see that this is something that has been strategic, this is something we can show in our research, that actually um, established parties have moved toward the radical right because they thought this would gain them the voters back. That hasn't happened, um, but it's been a reason why actually, in terms of policy, we've seen a shift toward the radical right. Yeah, particularly for the Dutch debate, but then I come to you. Um, I think this is an extremely interesting observation because the idea here among many journalists and politicians is, is that there is a group that has been overlooked, that hasn't been cared for, and they basically have abandoned, abandoned uh, the political realm, the afgehaakte. But what you say actually is the opposite, right? I mean, they are very well represented and their, their ideas are very much articulated in politics more recently, whereas other groups perhaps are less represented. So I think that's a very, well, something to reflect on, on for the Dutch. But before I go to you, um, because this is about the representation of voters for the radical right, you have been discussing class and disabled people. Do you see good examples? Do you see examples in Europe of uh, representation of those groups that are encouraging? Uh, and how then is it related to the system, right? Is indeed overall a proportional system more open, open to minority groups? Or is it more complex when you discuss class or when you discuss disabled people? Um, I think so. There are, in terms of, uh, as Tariq was saying, and I also wanted to say something quickly in relation to that, um, when we think about the representation or who the radical right is representing, um, and also in relation to this idea of anti-establishment and, and protest voting, I think at the beginning no, of the rise, or when we, in political science, was trying to explain the rise of radical right parties. A lot of the discussion was around whether this was just a protest vote. So people that were dissatisfied with the political system and they were just voting for the radical right just to express this uh, protest, this dissatisfaction with the political system, maybe with representation, right? We don't know if it was uh, precisely about that. Um, but then what came out from these different studies and what is quite established by now is that this wasn't a generic protest vote, right? It was an ideological protest vote. Mm -hmm. So it was a protest vote that was related to radical right attitudes, preferences on cultural issues, on economic issues. So I th and where in political systems where other political parties also adopted this protest discourse, we also observe protest radical left voting, for instance. And I think it's very interesting um, to see this example where protest voting is, uh, or yes, or dissatisfaction is not mobilized exclusively on the extremes of the ideological scale, but also in the center. Um, and so proportional systems um, allow for that diversification also, right? Um, 
and allow for the possibility for a protest vote to not just be about dissatisfaction with the system, but also to have an ideological, let's say, attachment to this. Where th obviously no where thresholds are low and where the political supply, it's also responsive to that, right? Because we also have to, uh, yeah, to take into consideration that the, the mechanic effects of the electoral system, right, how just the mathematical, let's say, implications of the, of the electoral system um, operate, but on a partisan supply, right? We need political entrepreneurs to put forward certain ideas, right? And so we could have a huge mass of um, radical right dissatisfied voters or the same on the left or in the center of the political spectrum, right? But if there is no one mobilizing or catering to those, uh, to those preferences, even if we have an extremely proportional electoral system, this might not translate into representation, right? So it's a combination of both. The, the, the proportionality of the system. And the offer. And yeah. the offer, yeah. yeah. Briefly, yeah, yeah. can yeah. I ask one question to, to, to Macarena? <laughs> um, would you agree that the radical right's been quite good at shaping class identities over the last 15 years or so? And, 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 and has the, I think the left has, in, to, in a way, withdrawn a bit mm -hmm. because they were afraid in formulating an inclusive uh, class identity that actually reflects what the working class looks like today. Um, and because of this, the, the radical right has actually been quite successful as, as, as really creating an idea of, especially what the, what, what, of working class identity mm -hmm. um, that, that has changed quite a bit. Yes, I think they, that, that's a good point and I think a valid observation for, for many European countries where I think maybe because social democracy you know, was facing this dilemma of saying how to increasingly appeal um, to the middle classes uh, while still trying to maintain that working class vote. Um, maybe also at a time you now of professionalization of politics and increasing appeal and trying to appeal to, you know, Many old parties um, spoke less about less and less about class in the 80s and the 90s, um, and I think yes, the radical right has been very successful in creating this identity that isn't always related to class. Right? It can be other terms can be used, no? Like the hardworking people, no, the ordinary man, the ordinary man. Yes, the the left behind. Um, and, and they have, in a sense, also being political entrepreneurs in their discourse in building this identity, which then has helped them mobilize this, this group. Right, thanks. Final words by you before we open it up. Yeah, yeah, so you asked um, whether there are any good examples and to what extent the electoral system matters for representation of certain social groups. And um, yes, normally we say that more proportional electoral systems are better for the representation of underrepresented groups and um, people from min minority, minoritized groups, because you know, ha if a party has you know a list rather than just one candidate in a constituency, then you know pushing someone who represents a certain underrepresented group up on that list generally doesn't mean that someone else loses out because there are more you know positions. Uh, on that list. And also, if representation is less localized, then, um, you know, where each MP represents one consti local constituency, that also means that then representatives maybe have a little bit of more freedom and leeway to focus more on representing so, uh, different social groups. Um, but it's not, like Macarena said, um, it's not completely kind of mechanical and other things also matter. So I also agree that, that parties really matter here, but maybe in a different way. Um, but yeah, so I would say one positive example, which we don't, a country that we don't hear very often about as a positive example in politics, but I would say um, that's the UK, where um, a disability representation is actually much, much more on the political agenda um, than it is in many other countries. And for instance, all the main political parties have disability groups, um, and they are quite, quite vocal and quite uh, influential in many cases. Um, so here, what parties do really matter is there's even some um, 
talk, and there have perhaps been some examples of um, all disabled lists, even where um, all the people who were um, nominated, who were standing for a selection for the candidate in a constituency, um, were disabled, which is something that's also often used for for women um, and also for um, for people of color. Um, but also the political system or political institutions on on the national level as well as um, on the devolved level, so in Scotland and in Wales. So, for instance, the UK, as far as I know, is the only um, country where there is an access to elected office fund where um, disabled candidates can apply um, for financial support for their election campaign. Now, in in the UK, on the like, UK level, that that used to exist. There were two pilot funds, but there are certain, there are plans and there are consultations right now to um, put that in place again, but it does currently exist in Scotland. And that's something that has been tremendously helpful for disabled candidates trying to stand for office because it's really, really expensive to stand for office in the first place. But then if you, you know, require um, personal assistance, for example, or, you know, money to, for, for, transport to get around on a campaign trail, that then really adds up and adds a lot more um, additional costs. So I would say in terms of, you know, the electoral system and how much that system, in the UK we have a first-past-the-post um, system, um, that in that sense it's not a system that would like, promote representation of underrepresented groups, but there are so many other things that can be done um, that can kind of diminish the, the influence of the electoral system a little bit. And it's, it's not enough. It's not enough to change the electoral system. No, I but it, it relativizes the mm -hmm. impact of the system, right? You say that is not... And it is nice to hear something positive about the UK. So mm -hmm. it's <laughs> nice. Um, we open it up to the audience. Uh, the idea is that we collect a couple of questions and then we see who will respond. So I love to see fingers. There are, is a finger there at the back side. Please try to be brief. <laughs> I'll try. Okay. So uh, I was born in the UK. Um, I became Dutch in 2019. And the last Dutch election is the very first election in my entire life. And I voted in every election that I could vote in where my vote actually mattered. Because every single election that I was in in the UK was an election where I was uh, voting in a safe seat for a party that I had no interest in. And it made me so happy to, for the first time in my life, to know that my vote counted precisely as much as every other person who voted. Um, no more, no less. That was, that was something that was just like, I, I really do not want to see the Dutch lose that. And you have a question? My question is, <laughs> what is the risk that that will be lost as a result of this upcoming election? Thanks. So that is indeed what will Omtzigt change if his proposal goes. To the, yeah, here to the right, left. Hi, thank you all for being here today. I have a question about the volatility of the Dutch um, voters in elections, as you illustrated earlier. Um, and how we saw in the 60s, it was very stable. Catholics were voting for Catholics, socialists were voting for socialists, and whereas now it's a lot higher. Is there something that directly explains that it, or a couple of different reasons that has been researched in recent years that helps explain why we're seeing this change? Thanks, and there was a question here as well, no? Perhaps if I may broaden the first question, so that was about that you were happy that you could finally vote for a party you really enthusiastic about, right? Um, you indicate that there is something like responsibility voters, so, or strategic voting, right? So I'm not sure whether Dutch voters always vote for the parties they really like most, uh, because here you also might think about what is the potential prime minister, coalition governments, and so on. So how does that play out in a proportional system? You start, and then there is the other question. You start. Um, yes, I'm happy to, to, to take the role of saying something critical about the current Dutch electoral system. Um, <laughs> so it is true that if you look at the question of representation, then in the Netherlands, your vote counts a lot. But if you look at it from a perspective of accountability, so let's say I want to affect who's in government in the end, um, 
then your, your vote doesn't count a lot. If you were unhappy with the politics of, or the policies of the, the CDA in the last basically 100 years, and you said, I really don't want to see that party in government, then that was pretty difficult to do because your vote didn't matter because in the end there would be a negotiation about the coalition and the CDA would, except for one period, end up always in a coalition. So these are, these are trade-offs that, that electoral systems have. Um, and so in that regard, the, 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 the Dutch uh, current electoral system um, has its problems. And there's a second problem that I think is very visible in these fragmented parliamentary systems. Um, and this is the, just the, the functionality of parliament. And the idea that people where the, the, the parliamentary group and the politicians that are elected in a parliamentary group that is just one or two people can really do the job of parliament controlling the executive, you can have a lot of doubts about that. Um, and so I think there's actually, I, I wouldn't propose or promote a first past the post system, but I think a lot speaks for, for a higher electoral threshold. And I know this is not necessarily a popular position uh, to take in the Netherlands, but I think there, there are good arguments for it. Here the German speaks. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, you want to say something about either yeah. both questions? Go yeah, on. so maybe yeah. To, to also add to this. Um, Yes, I also really like the Dutch system, but <laughs> there, are, <laughs> there are indeed some problems, right? So uh, there was this situation where there was um, the competition was between the PvdA and the VVD, and there, there was a, a horse race. Also, the media encouraged that, right? It's be between the who is going to be the prime minister. Well, who, who do you want to who, who do you want to vote for? And people were going uh, were voting strategically, so right wing people who might consider the PVV were voting for the VVD because they didn't want the PVDA to be the biggest party. The uh, left-wing voters who would m m might consider GroenLinks or the SP voted for the PVDA because they didn't want Rutte in, uh, in the tower. Um, but in the end, they got both. So they were both were really became really big and they got a coalition of PVDA and VVD. So that was really not what people intended with their vote. So there, there are also problems with this system of, uh, uh, of yeah, we, we cannot really have, um, we, what is going to happen with our vote when it comes to uh, government formation is a huge black box in the Netherlands. And that is, I think, a problem. Uh, your question about um, volatility, yeah, that, that's, a, I think it's very big processes that, that explain why all over Europe, and I think also the world, um, uh, electoral systems have become more volatile. And I think individualization is an important element, right? Uh, all, all, many organizations lost members, also political parties. Um, rising levels of education as well. People were more aware of, 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 of themselves and of what they wanted politically. But also um, um, the, the shift in, in focus. So, for instance, in the 70s it was... Uh, post-materialist values that became more important and people voted for green parties. Later on, globalization uh, was uh, was happening or was increasing. At least it was uh, higher on the political agenda, right, uh, immigration levels, for instance. And people were increasingly voting for the radical right. So I think it's the combination of um, new issues on the agenda, but also this process of individualization that happened. That, that is a slow process, of course, but you could also see it as a process that took decades uh, to, 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 to become so volatile. But you also see it as a form of emancipation, that people are not locked up in uh, pillars anymore, but they really vote based on, not by tradition, not by what they always voted, but each elections we have to think again, right? Yeah, but if I may add something to that, right? I think what was interesting was to show the picture of both volatility and stability, right? And so when we look at the big ideological blocks, that volatility fades away, right? And so this idea of individualization um, uh, or, or the idea that, yes, that now voters are choosing instead of their preferences or their voting being determined by, by their origins. Um, it does apply to some extent, right? Because it could be that certain voters, depending on the election, if they're more concerned about different kinds of issues, might vote for a Green Party in one election, then they might vote for the Social Democrats in a different election. Uh, 
but they're not widely shifting their opinions, right? And this is why we still see sociostructural factors to be important drivers of political preferences even today, right? So that individualization is not that radical. Um, and even if there was a lot of um, vertical mobility, you no know, upward mobility in Europe um, during, the, during the end of the 20th century, um, the relative position of individuals also didn't change as much, right? So um, maybe everyone's income or standard of living increased, but where you stand in the relative position in society with respect to, to where your parents stood did not change that much, right? That's what the sociologists call social fluidity. And so we might think we have experience, or it is true, no, that, that education is much higher, but the relative position of individuals in society doesn't change so much from one generation to the next. So, yeah, just to bring this also in, the, in context, yeah. yeah. Great, great answer. Uh, we open up, we have time for some more questions. Here's a question at the front. Hello, thank you all. Uh, you talked a lot about political parties, right, and how voters choose based on political parties, but I think that we forget that people, especially in countries with low trust into governments, democracies, politics, politicians, uh, they don't vote based on programs. They don't necessarily trust that even if this program and party is elected, will be, this will be implemented. So the leader or the, the persona is the one who is important. Uh, and the one persona that you mentioned was the only one from the new, new contract, was that the name of the party? So is that something, uh, is, is that telling us something? So would you agree that it is also about persona, how he is communicating, how he is presented, represented? And yeah, is there some, I don't know much about uh, the Dutch politi in current elections, but based on what, how you were representing, you were saying a lot about political parties, but, that, but then only the name of this persona. Is that something? Is, yeah. There, yeah. Wait, wait, are there more questions at the moment? Yeah, because then we collect two more. Yeah, thanks. Um, so my question is on the uh, demographic representation part, on like disa uh, disabled people being represented. And my question is, is that really something that on all groups is so much, um, so important for our society? So we have the specific example I think the most underrepresented group in society in parliaments are the ones that have no education whatsoever. But we also know, and Tarek said already, that this is also a craft to be in Parliament. You need to do legislature, you need to do quite a lot of stuff. And there's the question whether all those people can actually do that kind of skill. So is then electing those people in Parliament the best way to represent them, or is collectivized interest groups and institutionalizing them not a better way to get interest for marginalized peoples uh, in politics? Thanks. That are the questions for... Here's one more question. Sorry. Hello. Well, thank you all. Um, I just want to get back to the specific Dutch elections, what's happening now. Um, as you said, uh, that one of the few people or the voter that has been uh, lost the most in terms of the um, social democrats are the higher educated women. And if you look now at the merger between um, the Greens and uh, Labour and the type of person they've put forward to represent them. Do you think now, obviously, that that's a smart move as they, he very much represents the current status quo? Very open question. Uh, no. uh, yes, so I think there are questions that are related to all four of you. Perhaps we, s no, let's start with the representation question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Yeah. that's a, a definitely an interesting question. Um, can and should anyone be a politician? I mean, maybe not anyone, and that's probably why a lot of us are politicians. Um, obviously, there are certain skills involved, but then the question is also if, if it means that people who have low education levels or people with certain kinds of disabilities cannot be involved in policy making at that level, does that not mean that there is an issue with the institution, with the political process? Shouldn't we make it more accessible rather than 
you know, excluding them from the process. And of course you say that, well, there could be other ways of involving them, right? Um, I think what you were referring to probably was um, consulting interest groups, you know, having, um, yeah, there are obviously different ways of uh, yeah, interest groups, for example, charities and so on, to come in and feed into the policy-making process. But I think there are several issues with that. One issue is that those consultations very often only take place when issues are already on the agenda, right? But the, you know, the question of what issues are important, what political issues, what policies should actually be debated, um, that's something where, you know, legislators in parliament have a lot more influence than, um, yeah, different groups that, that might be consulted. Um, yeah, so I, my, my answer would be that, um, yeah, it requires more of a, of a shift in political culture. Um, but yeah, other people might, might have different opinions on that. <laughs> uh, on the same question or on the other one? So perhaps then we move on to the question regarding the Dutch and the merger and the leader of the merger. I will leave, leave uh, that one for, for that. Okay. I will, I will uh, 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 focus on the question about uh, Peter Omtzigt. Uh, and um, um, what is really interesting, I think, in, in this... Well, first of all, nobody votes because of the election program, because nobody reads the damn thing. Uh, <laughs> not even us, I think. I, I read a little bit of it, but not, not the whole... The introduction, maybe. Um, but... Um, so many people, of course, do have some affinity with a party because of the ideology of the party. But then also, right, people have usually several parties in their choice set, which they feel attracted to for ideological reasons. And then they pick the party during elections because of the several reasons that I've mentioned before. And their leadership plays an important, can play an important role. Um, when it comes to Omtzigt, I think it's really interesting because um, he, um, he is so popular because he really he is a um, very good parliamentarian and he is really into substance and he's really uh, um, 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 he's not just some leader with slogans he's really into the details of laws um, and that is what people really like about him but then the ironic thing is that people vote for him because of who he is and not so much because of the ideology of his party. So he was so popular already before there was an election program, before it was clear what he was going to say about education, uh, what about care, what about foreign policy. Nobody knew what he was going to say about that, but they were still uh, inclined to vote for him. And the reason is him. Uh, because they really think that he is a very good politician. Um, and I think it's really interesting, because Omtzigt himself, by the way, um, he once said that during an election campaign, that should not be about the face of the politician, it should be about substance. But now he is there with his face and all these posters. Uh, and it makes sense, because he knows that people vote for him and not for his party. Um, so it is a very interesting uh, thing that is going on here. He is a politician that really focuses on substance, but most people vote for him because of his person. Thanks. Macarena or Derek? I can. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try to answer the question if parties who want to appeal to educated women can still run old white men as their, as their main candidates. Um, which it wasn't, is my translation of the question, right, with, with, with Tim Timmerman. Yeah, but <laughs> okay. that's uh, it's my fault. I'll, I'll um, I think there are, there, there, there are a couple of elements to this that are interesting. Um, I think a general question that I don't necessarily have an answer to is um, why movements of the left are still so bad at uh, running women, especially for the for the main job. Um, I think it was actually uh, quite I mean, the only funny thing that Theresa May ever said was in, in in Parliament in the UK recently after the election of. Um, God, I already got in it. Liz Truss. Um, and Theresa May said why the Conservatives have had three uh, women prime ministers and Labour has ne never had one. Um, even if you look at the radical left, right, these, the, the, the people who have represented the radical left in the last years, Bernie Sanders, Jeremy Corbyn, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, um, 
they're all a very specific demographic, right? And, and so this, I don't have an explanation for this. Um, obviously, just patriarchy and, and structural sexism and so on, but it seems even a bit more prevalent on the left for some reason um, that I can't explain. There's another part, so, so why I think, from a purely electoral perspective, I think Timmermans is a good candidate, is um, the, the connection to previous executive experience. And this is something that in these candidate-focused elections is very important. And of course, again, with that, you will have a correlation with you know, um, being of a certain gender and being of a certain age. Um, but it, there, there are previous examples where you can really see that this has worked out. And I think the, the comparison to the German example is actually quite helpful there, um, where it, it is also an election where the, you know, there was a prime minister in, in, in office for a long time, um, then didn't run again, and in the end, the, quest, the, the election became a lot about um, the candidates. And there, um, Olaf Scholz, who I guess is in, in, in a way comparable to, to, to Timmermans, was even less progressive than Tim, Timmermans. And Timmermans actually, in, in, in his policy positions for, for a social democrat, um, more on the, on the progressive end, I would say. Um, and, 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 but Scholz really could, could gain these responsibility voters, these people who, who, who want uh, some type of executive experience, where also it's more difficult more difficult to project something onto them, right? So you could see this with, with, with Annalena Baerbock, the Green candidate, who had much less experience, who people knew less, especially didn't know, associated with an institutional function. They just knew her. And so these smaller so-called scandals just stuck more to her. And with Olaf Scholz, they had, they had less of an effect. And I think Joe Biden is, is another positive example, if you look at it from the left side, in terms of winning the election, where, again, this is especially older voters um, where these, these candidates matter a lot at the moment. And I think this is also relates to the other question. I think um, we, we are in a phase where, to a certain degree, these candidates, when they're in office, so it's, it, it's not candidates, it's incumbents, really. Incumbents create something that parties used to be able to create, but now it's much more tied to these, to these uh, people. And it's really difficult to vote out an incumbent after they've been in office for a full term. Um, this is really a pattern in European elections at the moment. I don't know for how long, and I haven't looked at it in detail, but Pedro Sanchez is another very good example of this, where you know he's been de declared dead multiple times, and he's still there. You can look at elections in the German states, um, and the last time that uh, minister president in, 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 in Germany was voted out of office, or their party then, there was party turnover after they had been in, uh, in, in an office for a full term was in 2017. So for six years, basically, um, there hasn't been uh, a turnover of the main party uh, leading uh, a government in one of the German, German states after there had been a, a full term in power. So there is something, this might have something to do with polycrisis world, and I don't know, where really these, these incumbents create um, that attachment, and generally for candidates then, the, the question is who is closest to this idea, and I think their executive experience matters a lot. All right. Perhaps a last question, if that's okay with the audience, and then there will be drinks. Um, uh, well, first of all, the, the, the Greens, of course, are uh, a party that was the outcome of a merger of three small left-wing parties, and the three small left-wing parties all had female leaders. So there is a kind of tradition at the radical left in the Netherlands for having, so Ina Brouwer, André van Es, uh, Beckers, Ria Beckers, yeah. Do you know which party has female leaders all over the place? The Christian Union. Yeah, that's true. So it's not exclusively, yeah, right. Um, one of the things that is somewhat puzzling, and I come back actually to you, how you started about the importance of representation of um, groups whose interests are not enough taken into account, and that therefore experiential knowledge is, is important, right, as you articulated. In the Dutch debate now, uh, there is something that really strikes me all the time, that is on the one hand, identity politics are disqualified, but then a certain type of identity politics. So when you speak about representation of people of color or LGBTQI or women, that is really disqualified as a wrong form of identity politics. But when we speak about the farmers, or the have-nots, or the working class, then suddenly that is beautiful. They really should be represented. 
So there seems to be a certain well, selection in which groups can claim legitimate identities in politics. And do you recognize that? But also then in the long run, I was thinking, would it be a problem if we have a parliament of 80% women, for instance? I mean, so the moment discrimination becomes less, and imagine that disabled people are not discriminated against anymore. Would it be a problem that some groups are not so much represented? Or is it very much linked to their societal position? And that therefore, temporarily, we think it is important to have this form of representation. Well, that is a final question. If you can start, please. Yeah, can I just ask a question, quick question? What you mean by disabled people aren't discriminated? No, in the long run. So if it if it if oh, it if is, they are if they are at not some sorry. Point in yeah, the so I, I, hyper, mm -hmm. hypothetical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely would say um, that it is more important to you know invest in um, increasing the representation of social groups that are underrepresented at that time, and especially if they are you know, facing discrimination, marginalization in society, because that means that there is something systematic you know, about their interests, about their preferences that is being ignored, right? Um, so there is, there is a political need that needs to be addressed. Um, of course, that could be addressed by other people, but then you know, we would ask, well, why hasn't it then? And maybe that is because it is just very difficult, it's very unlikely, you know, other um, like non-group members are just, in that case, unlikely to really understand what those interests or those needs are, or they're not incentivized. Um, you know, of course, that always plays a role as well. And then, especially if you have minority groups that are unlikely to be a, a majority of the electorate, and necessarily, you know, really help parties out in electoral terms, um, then that kind of in extrinsic incentive to represent that group might not be there. Um, but yeah, it's a very prominent argument that this descriptive representation is particularly important when the needs of a group are ignored, um, when they're not very well known, um, also when there is distrust between you know, the underrepresented group um, and the minority and the majority group. Of course, there are also other reasons for why, you know, we want, well, many of us, you know, would say that, that we should want democratically a more diverse and inclusive, um, you know, political stage, right? So, you know, seeing people like you in politics has a lot of other benefits than those people potentially better understanding your interests and preferences, right? Um, they might get people more politically engaged, more politically interested, um, more supportive of the democratic process, which is obviously, you know, a big problem that we've seen. Um, in so the there's a broader years. argument there, mm -hmm. you think? Yes, I mean, adding to uh, what Stephanie was also saying, I think the the idea to to include um, the structurally disadvantaged. I mean, progressive politics has always been about identity politics. I just like right now. I think this the problem is that many left wing parties have bought into this right wing narrative of suddenly saying that certain things are identity politics and others aren't, but. Identity, advancing uh, wor working class rights, um, advancing um, gender equality, um, were identity politics that have been advanced by left-wing parties for decades. Um, it's just, um, and even many of this, a lot of this discourse on the idea of the left behind, if we look at this group, sometimes they might be losing out somewhat, but they're people that are doing even worse, right? So they're not... Uh, they're not always the most left behind, let's say, or even the left behind at all. So I think that this is not, uh, it's not a, an objective differentiation, right, between there are certain groups that are about identity politics, other aren't. And I think the left could do better in, in not buying into that, that narrative. Right. Thanks, Derek. Um, yeah, maybe two things. The, the first, also, and, and, and very much in, in line with what, what Stephanie said, 
of course, descriptive representation is not about the essentialized characteristic of a group. It's not about women should represent women because something is particular about women and this will be that way for all of eternity. Descriptive representation is about historically concrete experiences and especially if they are historically concrete experiences of oppression. Um, so if we are in, in, in a world at some point where men have gone through decades or centuries or millennia of oppression, then of course we should worry about 80% women in parliament and only 20% men in parliament. And until we reach that point, descriptive representation has its value in these kinds of shared experiences being represented and being part of deliberation. Um, on the left in identity politics, I would say the opposite is true. Um, the left hasn't done enough identity politics in the last 20 years, especially social democratic parties have withdrawn from trying to create identities that are linked to their policies. This is actually, I think, an underestimated legacy of new labor and, and, and the, the third way, right. is that social democrats have become managerial parties. They're somewhat about solving policies. And they have withdrawn from the essential business of, of politics. And this is actually, you can go back to Marx with this, like class in itself as a, as a central category of politics. Um, this, is, this is what parties need to do. And this is something that social democratic parties have not done. And then if you're in a competition between policy solutions and identities, you will always lose out. And I think climate politics are the best example for this at the moment where clearly one side has the better policy arguments. It's, I mean, there's no doubt that we need to do something about climate change and we need to do it fast, but the right has very successfully created an anti-identity to this. It's the ordinary man that drives a car, um, that wants to eat meat, da, 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 da. That is an identity and that is currently winning in the political struggle around that issue. And this is one example of what happens when the left is does, is afraid to, 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 to um, create political identities. Thanks. More identity politics. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe to, to, uh, to, make a, to try to make a prediction as a political scientist. We should, of course, never do that, but uh, let's, let's try it. Um, maybe this is, and I think this is also what you have already hinted at, it is maybe more than before in the Netherlands, but also beyond about the distinction, the old-fashioned distinction between conservatism and progressivism to some extent. Conservatism to the extent that it's about, for many people, about the heartland of people and, and life as it has always been uh, on the farm maybe uh, or in the countryside, eating meat, uh, ride, driving your truck, etc. Um, and that is an identity that should be protected and that, sh that, that, that can be expressed for more conservative people. Progressivism um, I think it's increasing on the left side of the political spectrum that you see a focus on, uh, well, the, 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 the emancipation of different groups, of focusing on that identity of uh, people of color, uh, uh, women, uh, the LGBT community, uh, etc. And I think these are issues that are becoming more and more important in the Netherlands and I think also beyond the Netherlands. So maybe what we are seeing is in the Netherlands this... Um, conflict between conservatism and progressivism has not been at the forefront for years, I would say, but maybe it's coming back, my prediction. I will probably be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Well, that is a modest prediction, right? So, let's see. Uh, thanks so much. Um, this is really extremely insightful. And I have to say, I'm not a political scientist, right? So I'm, I'm really impressed by how thoughtful you are and how articulate you are. I, I raise one question and they talk for 10 minutes, right? It is really <laughs> wonderful. No, so I'm very serious. Thanks so much for these wonderful uh, insights. Thanks. Thank